I recently played through Tales of Arise. Yes, I promise this is relevant. Kind of. It was an interesting game. It started strongly with an engaging setting, intriguing premise, and characters who at least had potential to develop in compelling ways. And it sustained my interest for quite a while. For about, ooh, 20 hours in fact? Unfortunately, it took me nearly 40 hours to finish the game. By the time I got to the end of those 40 hours, by god was I ready for the game to be over. The plot had descended into nonsense, the characters were really starting to get on my nerves, I basically stopped caring even slightly about what was going on. Which is a shame, because the writers of the game had put a lot of time and effort into world building and exploring the motivations of the characters. Unfortunately, time and effort does not always equate to quality, and after spending what felt like a hundred years listening to the characters explore their feelings and discuss their past, and talk about their various doubts and fears and hopes and dreams in excruciating detail, I was seriously hoping that the game would end with them all dying painful deaths and the world being taken over by owls. That may sound random, but the owls were genuinely my favourite characters in the game, possibly because they didn't have any actual dialogue. The final dungeon in particular was a real letdown. It was a series of rather boring, generic rooms and corridors punctuated with monotonous battles. I didn't really know why I was there and I definitely didn't care. It was a grind. And while I was grinding away, my focus drifted, and I started thinking about other games that did similar things, that contained similar elements, but somehow managed to keep my attention right up to the very end. And from there, of course, I started thinking about Final Fantasy. Now, maybe you don't like Final Fantasy, and that's fine, I get it, it's not for everyone. But as I've said in the past, I love it. A lot. It's easily my favourite game series of all time. Easily. And even if you do like Final Fantasy, maybe you don't like it when people try to rank the games within the series, and I get that too. It can be divisive, or it can seem pointless since it can't be objective, and maybe it would be better just to appreciate the games for what they are and not try to say which is better. But I've never pretended to be objective, and I like both expressing opinions and hearing the opinions of others, even if they're totally the opposite of my own. So take this as an invitation to tell me what you think I've got wrong, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of that. Before I start, a couple of things. There will be spoilers here, so be warned. Also, for this list I'm only considering the numbered mainline games in the series, so there's no 10-2 or 13-2 or Lightning Returns, which probably wouldn't make this list anyway. And there's no 7 remake, which probably would. Also, you might be wondering why the 9 entries on this list? Well, to be honest, that's as many of the mainline games I've played and remember well enough to be able to talk about intelligently. Well, for certain definitions of the word intelligently. So if your favourite FF isn't on this list, that doesn't mean I think it sucks, it just means that I don't really have enough to say about it. Okay, let's get to business. My list for the top 9 Final Fantasy games. Starting with, in ninth place... Yes, the most recent Final Fantasy is also my least favourite. And I want to stress least favourite there. I absolutely love every single game on this list. But something had to fill the bottom spot, and Final Fantasy XV falls short in a few key areas that landed in last place. XV was the first in the series to go open world. Well, the first single player game anyway. This was a somewhat controversial choice at the time, but I personally was willing to give it a chance. The result was mostly a success, but not a complete one. The world design was great, but it was neither as open nor as expansive as it might have seemed at first. A lot of it was literally fenced off and inaccessible, and the parts of it that were accessible weren't really packed with interesting places and fascinating points of discovery, making exploration a little unsatisfying. The main characters were well constructed and likeable, with the whole game taking on the tone of a road trip. XV is unusual amongst Final Fantasy games in that your party never changes, the four boys set out on this journey together and they'll be with you all the way, with a few minor deviations. Is this a good thing? I'm kind of ambivalent about it. On the one hand, it allows the player to really bond with these characters and for the characters to bond with each other, but the variety of the main characters has always been a strength of the Final Fantasy games. And here you've got four bros with slightly different haircuts and personalities. Which is fine in this game, but I'm glad it's the exception rather than the rule. 
Unfortunately, while the main characters are good, the overall story is a little lacking. 15 had a famously tumultuous development. Indeed, it was originally not intended to be Final Fantasy 15 at all, but rather a spin-off of Final Fantasy 13. It started development in 2006, 10 years before the final product was eventually released, and just how much of an impact this time spent in development hell had on the narrative is tough to pin down. Certainly there were a hell of a lot of changes made along the way, even after the game had officially become Final Fantasy XV. The first proper trailer from 2013 was amazing and had me really looking forward to seeing the final product, but so much of what was shown in that trailer ended up being drastically altered or removed altogether. Ultimately the story is basically fine but lacks any strong central foundation. Some of the most important narrative moments feel tacked on, especially towards the end, and none of the characters other than the central four feel very fleshed out. And that really is a shame. There's a moment in that original trailer I mentioned that shows the faces of 12 characters, and I remember being very excited to find out more about every single one of them, and confident that I would be satisfied with what I learned. This time, alas, my confidence was misplaced. Some of them were barely in the game at all, and most of them were just not that interesting. Gameplay wise, here's the thing, I've never really cared all that much about the gameplay, by which I mean the actual combat in Final Fantasy games. Yes, it matters, but it's well down my list of priorities and barely factors into this list. An interesting world, a story that appeals to my particular tastes, characters I enjoy, these are all much, much more important for me when it comes to Final Fantasy. So I won't necessarily be talking that much about gameplay in this list. That said, 15 probably has my least favourite combat out of any game on this list, it's just not very engaging. I mostly just held down one button while throwing out the occasional spell or ability when it seemed like a good time to do so. It's not exactly boring, certainly it can be a visual spectacle at times, but it's not something I ever really thought about. There's one last area where 15 is my least favourite in this list. It's one that for me is much, much more important than the combat, and that's the music. Now the music is good, no doubt, it's high quality and it perfectly fits the tone of the game. It's exciting and energetic in combat, and it's appropriately moody and emotional in the darker moments. But it's just not that memorable. It's well-produced orchestral stuff, the sort of thing any dramatic film would be proud of, but to me it's just background music. The sort of thing that sounds good while playing the game, but that I've never felt inspired to just go and listen to for its own sake. And that's fine. It's a conscious stylistic choice by the designers to not bring the music to the forefront, and it makes sense. In older FF games, with more limited technology and less of a cinematic presentation, the music was more responsible for creating atmosphere and character. In fact, the music almost became a character in itself. But it's not like that in 15, and while I can't deny the quality of the music and the fact that it succeeds at what it's trying to do, I just wish it had been given the chance to really hook itself into my brain like so much other Final Fantasy music has. Well, I better move on to the next game before this entry becomes an essay in itself. Is this your idea of vengeance? It is my idea of necessity. If we do not act now, it is not only our future you imperil. Actually, a lot of the problems I had with 15 hold true for 12 as well, but overall I think 12 is a much more solid and interesting game. Visually, I think it's fantastic. It was one of the best looking games on the PlayStation 2 and the overall aesthetic is amazing. It fuses fundamentals of traditional Western fantasy with Middle Eastern inspirations and steampunk elements and then twists it all into a recognisably Final Fantasy style. The characters in particular were brilliantly realised in terms of outward appearances at least. They were more grounded in reality than previous Final Fantasy games and the animation was a real step up. It may not look like anything special these days, but I specifically remember this being the first time I thought of character models not just as game assets, but as digital performers. This was helped by the fact that 12 has some of the best voice acting I've ever heard in a game, even if it also sounded a little odd due to heavy compression. Unfortunately, like 15 before it, the story in 12 just doesn't quite resonate for me. It's a complicated narrative with a lot of political intrigue and serious important people doing serious important things, and as such, the whole thing feels a little more impersonal, a little less emotionally engaging than other FFs. In a way, this was a deliberate choice by the writers, and really I have to applaud them for it, because it must have been kind of a risk. The thing is, Van, the main character, or at least the one you spend most of your time controlling, is really not a particularly interesting character. 
He's just a kid with dreams of being a sky pirate who gets swept up into complex events way beyond his understanding. In many ways, he's an observer, someone who tags along while the important stuff happens around him. He doesn't really contribute much to the advancement of the plot or to the emotional foundation of the story. There are other player characters who do contribute more to the plot, of course, but there's a pervasive seriousness and world weariness to them that is unusual in Final Fantasy games. Ash, for instance, is only 19 years old but has already seen her kingdom invaded and her young husband killed. Bosch, who was a knight in the invaded kingdom, was framed for treason and spent months being tortured. Then there's Penelo, who is there too. She may actually be the least memorable main character in any Final Fantasy. I'm not even sure I pronounced the name correctly. The two best characters in the game, in my opinion, are Balthier and Fran, a sky pirate and his rather wild companion. As fugitives from the law, they're more free-spirited than most of the other characters and honestly more fun to be around. Plus, Fran's voice, it stirs things within me. Ultimately, I don't object to the more serious tone this game takes or the fact it doesn't really have one central character or the complex plot. I consider these to be worthy and interesting choices, but the game can't quite bring all these things together in a satisfying way. Previous games in the series didn't try to be so grounded in reality, so they could get away with much more outlandish ways to resolve their plots, but 12 can't be quite so over the top. I mean, sure, there's a big climactic battle against a godlike entity, but there's no time compression here, you don't find out the main character is just a dream of a dead civilization, you don't fight a one-winged angel in a strange netherworld. And for my money, Final Fantasy is at its best when it allows itself to go over the top. Once again, I'll end with a word or two about the music, because if you haven't picked up on it by now, it's always an important ele element for me. Like 15, the music in 12 is largely symphonic, and also like 15, I don't find it super memorable. There are some great tunes here though, and I do rate it significantly higher than 15 in this respect. A lot of the music, and indeed a lot of the game, is heavily inspired by Star Wars, and the composer has done a great job of evoking that sense of excitement and grandeur. Once again though, there just aren't all that many tracks I felt inspired to listen to outside of the game. Guess we're fighting. Thirteen was the point where I realised that I enjoy Final Fantasy for different reasons to a lot of people. I bought it at release, I played through it, I loved every single second of it. Then I went online and checked what other people thought of it. I was very surprised to see that the general reaction from series fans was mixed at best. Some of the complaints I could understand even if I didn't personally agree with them. The game world was more restrictive than any previous Final Fantasy game. In many ways it was just a linear series of corridors. There wasn't a great deal of exploration to be done, and there wasn't much in the way of post-game content or replayability. Once you'd finished the main story, you'd pretty much seen most of what the game had to offer. For me, that was enough. To my mind, the story was exactly what a Final Fantasy story should be. Outlandish, melodramatic, a little confusing, but coherent enough that everything could eventually be brought to a satisfying, if over-the-top, conclusion. I loved the characters too. There wasn't much about them that was subtle or nuanced, but I understood their motivations, and I thought they were a diverse, intriguing bunch. But many, many people didn't agree with me. Either they didn't find the story and characters good enough to overlook the linearity and lack of exploration and post-game content, or they just outright disliked the story and characters altogether. Now like I say, I totally get that some people aren't going to like Final Fantasy, it's not for everyone. But I really was surprised that fans of the series, people who liked the melodramatic over-the-top storylines and settings of previous Final Fantasy games, weren't willing or able to buy into the world of 13. Some people found the opening sections confusing and too drawn out, whereas I loved being placed right in the middle of a bizarre, hostile world and only slowly being able to piece together everything. Some people found the characters unlikable or too weak and whiny, and I guess I can understand that, but I'm pretty sure that if I was placed under similar extreme circumstances, I'd have a hard time coping too. Ultimately, I think it just comes down to the fact that, unlike a lot of fans, I was willing to buy into the world of 13, to suspend my disbelief and go with the flow. It helped that I found every visual aspect of the game to be gorgeous. It's possibly the most anime-inspired game in the series, and for my taste, that's no bad thing. It was also the first FF on a new generation of consoles, and honestly, even today I think it holds up, both in terms of graphics and style. The world design is fantastic, 
and the music complements it perfectly. I had been worried that without Nobuo Uematsu, the music of Final Fantasy might lose its special appeal, but Masashi Hamautsu's work on 13 reassured me that the series was in safe hands. Of all the entries in this list, this was perhaps the one that I had the toughest time deciding where to place. Final Fantasy IX is a remarkable game that I dearly love. Every now and then I see people arguing for it actually being the best Final Fantasy and I almost find myself being convinced. It's a truly remarkable game. In many ways it's a throwback to the earliest games in the series, but perfectly updated for the PS1 era. Everything about it is just impossibly charming. The world is a gorgeous medley of Western fantasy, Studio Ghibli-esque whimsy, and that Final Fantasy spark of uniqueness. Just walking around, interacting with NPCs and exploring hidden corners is a nice experience, aided by the light, pleasant music. Indeed, compared to most FFs, 9 is a generally light and pleasant JRPG experience. That's not to say there isn't darkness and danger and high emotion, there's plenty of that, but it's all couched in a setting and narrative that's more likely to leave you feeling jubilant than melancholy. And every single location, character model, piece of music and sound effect has clearly been lovingly created and polished by true artisans of the JRPG world. This is truly a game that shines. And yet. Once again, the narrative doesn't quite come together in the way that it does in my very favourite Final Fantasy games. There is a lot of wandering about for somewhat vague reasons in this game, and although the places you'll wander to and the characters you'll encounter there are frequently amazing, the narrative drive often seems to be too meandering and drawn out for its own good. Now this is arguably true of most, if not all, Final Fantasy games. It's one of the reasons why I totally get why some people would find them quite boring. If you're not really invested in what's going on, you'll really feel like your time is not being respected. But in 9 in particular, the reasons for many of the plot's meandering seem a little half-hearted. Even this wouldn't really be worth mentioning if the overarching narrative came to a grand, satisfying conclusion, and, well it actually does by most JRPG standards, but by FF standards it's not quite as grand or satisfying as the high entries on this list. The combat and character development systems too are far from my favourite in the series. The combat is turn-based and fairly simple even by FF standards, and that's okay, but there's also not really that much flexibility or interest in levelling up your characters and developing their abilities. It can all get a little bit tedious. Having said all this, I'm really really keen to see the Final Fantasy series return to the tone of whimsy and quirky fantasy that 9 embodied. I was hoping 16 would be that return, but clearly it's gone in the exact opposite direction and hopefully I'll be addressing that in a separate video very soon. For now though, 9 is a remarkable, fantastic game that nevertheless doesn't quite exemplify the pinnacle of FF greatness. Now, I have to acknowledge that my perspective on FF6 is a little different to all the other games on this list. It's the only one that I didn't play when it was new. I never owned a SNES, and even if I had, 6 was never released in Australia. So I didn't play it until emulation became common, by which time I'd already played 7 and 8 and absolutely fallen in love with the series. So 6 was essentially a retro experience when I got around to playing it, and yet it still managed to kind of blow my mind. I'd assume that 7 was an absolute revolution in the world of JRPGs, a game totally unlike anything that had come before it. But here, in Final Fantasy VI, I saw that actually quite a lot of that revolution had already taken place in the 16-bit world. Sure, the presentation was massively less sophisticated than the 32-bit games that would follow it, but I mean, of course it was. This is the Super Nintendo after all. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. There's a reason why pixel art is still popular, and it's not just to do with nostalgia. But the narrative complexity and the depth of the characterizations was remarkable to me. I hadn't known that any 16-bit games existed that were so ambitious in their storytelling. I'd played quite a few Mega Drive JRPGs and loved them, and I still love many of them, but none of them could rival FF6. In fact, none of them came close. It's not a perfect game. 
it's a little messy in its construction. It sometimes feels like the developers tried to squeeze too much into the story and not all of it works. But I will always prefer something that surprises me over something I can predict, even if the ways it's surprising are not always 100% positive. I actually find it interesting to compare FF6 to Chrono Trigger in this respect. Chrono Trigger has a highly refined, coherent and well-crafted narrative, but it didn't quite catch my attention in the same way that FF6 did, and nor does it remain so clear in my memories. By which I mean no disrespect to Chrono Trigger, by the way. It's my second favourite game on the Super Nintendo. However, 6 edges it for me. But this video is about comparing FF games against each other, and although it's the oldest game on this list, it still holds up well. And I mean that even without taking its age into account. If you do take its age into account, I think you could argue it should be even higher on this list, and that it may actually be the most important FF game of them all. And as usual, a word about the music. It's simply amazing. I still maintain that I prefer the Mega Drive's overall sound with its more electronic synth-heavy tones as compared to the Super Nintendo's attempts to emulate real instruments, but here, at the hands of Nobuo Uematsu, the Super Nintendo's sound chip is used to its maximum effect. In some ways, 6 is the epitome of old-school FF music, and it might just be Uematsu's crowning achievement. Whenever the topic comes up of what game a Final Fantasy newcomer should play first, I always suggest 10. For my money, it combines what is best about old and new Final Fantasy, even if that might seem increasingly like an odd thing to say as 10 sales well past its 20th birthday. It has everything that I personally want most in a Final Fantasy. A unique and interesting world, distinctive characters who undertake both a physical and emotional journey, twists and turns that are surprising without being totally implausible, all wrapped up in stunning visuals and sound design. And although I've said that the combat was never my main priority in any Final Fantasy game, 10 probably has my personal favourite combat and levelling system of any FF. The combat is turn-based, indeed it's the last time a mainline FF game had fully turn-based combat, and I think it's the most refined version of turn-based combat the series ever saw. It's simple enough, easy to comprehend, but your choices always matter and strategy is important and the Sphere Grid was the one time I became truly motivated to properly max out all my character's stats, although truth be told, I never completely managed it. However, there's one thing that 10 did that changed the series forever, and not necessarily for the better, and that's the introduction of voice acting. I honestly believe this might be the single most significant change in the entire series, and it's something I remain ambivalent about, even though it was obviously inevitable that FF would have to embrace voice acting in the new millennium. But it fundamentally changed how the stories were told, and in an odd way made them much harder to tell effectively. The thing is, the dialogue in FF games had always been a little up and down. I love the overarching stories of them, but if you look specifically at the words the characters used, they weren't necessarily remarkable. With text, that's kind of okay. Your brain does a lot of the work of interpreting their meaning and how they should be delivered. When voice acting became a thing, however, it was up to the voice actors to make these decisions, and they don't always make them in the same way I would have, which I personally find very jarring. Ten suffered from this, albeit in a relatively minor way. Most of the voice acting ranges from okay to really good, but Yuna and specifically Titus had some moments where they started grating on my ears. Oh, and no, I'm not referring to the infamous laughter scene here. That was actually fine when you know the context behind it. But on the whole, I wasn't a huge fan of the voice actor's characterization of Tidus. On the whole though, I think the voice acting for 10 could have turned out a lot worse than it did, and later installments did a better job with the voice acting. Like I said earlier, the performances in 12 were particularly great, I thought. Ultimately, 10 is a perfect example of a Final Fantasy game. The presentation is top-notch in every respect, and most importantly, the story is coherent yet complex, compelling, perfectly paced, and emotionally devastating. The only reason it doesn't place in the top 3 for me is because the stories of the games that follow resonated with me personally just a little more.
Final Fantasy VII is a monumental game in every sense. It's probably the most broadly popular game in the series, and the most influential. I still think VI is the one that really defined the series in the most significant way, but VII took what made VI great and amplified it for the 32-bit era. The story is nuts, in the best possible way. It's one of the most complex in JRPG history, and one of the most over the top, and yet it miraculously holds it all together through a narrative that manages to be epic in scope while also deeply personal. As my first ever experience of Final Fantasy, it absolutely blew me away when I first played it, but not in an entirely positive way. It was so unlike anything I'd ever encountered. My idea of the perfect JRPG at that point was Sui Koden, which was a great game, but also very traditional and quite simplistic in its storytelling. Final Fantasy VII, on the other hand, was not simplistic at all, particularly at the beginning. Nowadays I'm accustomed to FF games taking a bit of time to piece things together to really let you know what's going on in the world, and I've come to enjoy that. But when I first played VII, I found the opening sections in Midgar to be a confusing ordeal more than a pleasant gaming experience. But it didn't take too long for the game to hook me in, and suffice it to say I've been hooked on FF ever since. I can't really say a lot about VII that hasn't been said before. It's one of the most talked about games of all time. Even people who have never even wanted to play it know that Eris dies, and if that's a spoiler for you, well honestly you've done extremely well to avoid it for so long. Cloud is one of the best known heroes in gaming, and Sephiroth is one of the best known villains. It's probably the characters that are the single best and most important aspect of Seven. They're just so iconic, so compelling. But everything about Seven is peak JRPG design. The graphics, the world design, the characters, you know, all those things I've already talked about ad nauseum in previous entries. Seven does everything as well as any other FF game. The only thing that could possibly come in for criticism is the rather crude, low-poly character models, but honestly they're all part of the charm, and just having 3D characters at all was a big deal for a JRPG at the time. And yes, the music. I said 6 might have been Uematsu's crowning achievement, but if it wasn't that, it was definitely 7. There are tracks here that are essentially as iconic as the characters. Can you even think of Eris without hearing her theme? Would Sephiroth be quite so kick-ass if it wasn't for one winged angel? I wouldn't argue with anyone who said Final Fantasy VII was the best game of all time. I just wouldn't quite agree. This will actually be a shorter entry than most. And the reason for that, that, this is easily the most subjective and personal placement for me. I've talked about Final Fantasy games resonating with me emotionally and personally. This is the one that I'm mostly thinking of. I'm not going to talk about the presentation, or the graphics, or the world, or the combat, or even the music or the story, except to say they're all great. Is 8 the best of the single player FFs? I almost don't care, and I'm not going to try to convince you that it is. There are plenty of valid reasons why you could argue that it isn't but it is my favourite. And the reason for that is simply the impact that Squall's emotional journey had on me personally. I was a few years older than Squall is in the game when I first played it, but I was at about the same level of emotional maturity. I was quiet and socially inept in a way that could have been interpreted as surly. I wanted to connect with other people but didn't know how to go about it. I was self-conscious and awkward. I saw a lot of myself in Squall. I mean, he was also good looking and in peak physical shape, whereas I wasn't. But still, in many ways, Squall was what I wanted to be. What I also wanted, really, really wanted, was a girlfriend. Turns out being quiet and socially inept isn't great for meeting girls. And even Squall only got to dance with Renoa because he was the best looking guy in the room. And the only room in which I would have been the best looking guy would probably have been the morgue at a hospital for the terminally ugly. In Squall, I found a character I could truly identify with. In Renoa, I found a character I could almost fall in love with. In their story, I found a romance that gripped my heart and nearly wrenched it from my chest. To some people, this will seem ludicrous, but to some others, it will be very familiar. The greatness I see in 8 can be summarised by one single moment. It is literally the last thing that happens in the game, after the final battle, after the dramatic ending, after the credits. Squall smiles. This, this is what the entire game has been leading to. This epic 40 hour JRPG has been a journey to a smile. <laughs> 
Nothing more, nothing less. And it's one of the biggest emotional payoffs in video game history. Maybe the biggest. Well, here we are, number one. I already made a video about 14 ages ago, and not much has changed since then, except the game got another unbelievably awesome expansion in the form of Endwalker. If you want to know why I love 14 so much, go watch that video. Seriously, please watch it. It's one of my favorite videos of the ones I've made. So I'm not going to spend any time here talking about what makes 14 my favorite FF game. Instead, I'm going to talk about why I think it should be on this list at all. The thing is, 14 is an MMO. It's also a game that has been in constant development for well over a decade now, during which time it has evolved from a complete failure to a comprehensive success to an absolute miracle of gaming. In these respects, it's undeniably very different to the other games on this list. Regarding it being an MMO, I definitely don't think this is a reason to exclude FF14. The thing is, yes, it's massively multiplayer, it's always online, but those things don't have to matter much depending on how you play. It's possible to play the game almost entirely as a single player experience, and indeed as the development of 14 has continued, more and more features have been introduced to make the game more accommodating to lone gamers. And as a fundamental gaming experience, 14 is as true a Final Fantasy game as any of them. Plus if you do choose to dive into the more complex online components, you'll find one of the best and most welcoming communities in all of gaming. Regarding the continuing development and several expansions that 14 has seen over the years, yes, this does give it a kind of unfair advantage over the other games on this list, which had one development cycle and released as one game, or in the case of 15, one game with some DLC. So maybe it would make more sense to consider each expansion as a separate game and rank them accordingly. The thing is though, if I did this, instead of 14 occupying the top spot, it would occupy the top two spots, with the Endwalker expansion in second and the Shadowbringers expansion in first, and Heavenswood would be near the top as well. So I guess I'll leave it up to you. If you agree with my rationale, that's cool. If you think 14 has no place on this list, just bump all the other entries up a slot. If you think each expansion should be its own entry, put Shadowbringers and Endwalker at 1 and 2 respectively, and slot Heavenswood in between, let's say, 10 and 7. Well, there you have it. My favourite Final Fantasy games, ranked in order of just how much I absolutely love them. Good thing there's not another game in the series coming out in a few days that might completely disrupt this list. Anyway, what do you think? Agree? Disagree? I love talking about this stuff, so do please let me know in the comments what you think I've got right, and what you think I've got wrong. And you know, like and subscribe, that sort of thing. For now though, get off my lawn. <laughs>